Hey guys, Cliff Gray here with Flat Tops Wilderness Guides and True Hunts. Today, I thought it was a good day to go over firewood and making fires in an elk or deer camp up here in the wilderness. I found that uh, not only this last year, but just years in the past, that a lot of guys that are going into drop camps um, that we're taking in our outfitting business or that are just doing uh, wall tent camps on their own, they, they need a little guidance on uh, what, what wood to use, um, where to find it, what, what species of trees to focus on, and then how to get actual dry wood. It's not that guys are naive. I mean, most guys in their life have used a fireplace in their home or, or a wood-burning stove in their home, but in this environment, there's a few, few big differences. One, there's not the availability of just seasoned wood, right? So well-dried wood around an elk camp in the alpine environment. Um, it's not just going to be there in a big stack for you. So you got to know where to find wood that's kind of seasoned by nature or dried by nature where it's going to burn well in your stoves. And then you have to deal with the species that are available in the elk woods, right? And so most wilderness areas, um, in, in ours in particular, like the high elevation wilderness areas, you're going to be dealing with firs, spruces, some pine, and aspen, right? Some of the lower elevation areas, you're going to see some gambles oak, pinion, um, you know, lodgepole pine, and some other varying species. But for the most part, it's going to be fir, spruce, and aspen. So I'll, I'll talk you through kind of what to focus on when, when that's what you have available. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, right off the bat, you know, uh, I was cleaning some wood stoves here and was just looking in here. One thing you're gonna find is that creosote builds up in your pipe, right? And this is no big deal, it's a part of outfitting. We end up uh, cleaning this stuff up, this, this black uh, creosote that builds up in the pipes. But if you're getting a lot of creosote in your wood stove, in your wall tents, um, and a lot of times the first place you see them is on this, which is your spark arrestor that sits on top of the pipe outside of the tent. I'll, I'll ride up to a tent sometimes and this will just be sooted in almost completely black, all right? This one's nice and clean, but if this is starting to soot in really black, or you don't feel like you're getting really, you know, really warm um, uh, warmth off your wood stove, there's two things it typically is. One, you're either burning your fire in your wood stove too slow, so you've got it dampened down too low, or your wood is too wet. The moisture content's too high in your wood. Usually it's probably partly partly both like you're trying to dampen down um, the stove when you go to bed So you have some coals in the morning. It doesn't just burn through that'll create creosote and it'll obviously reduce the the heat of the uh, the uh, uh, wood stove um, Or you're you're it's just hard to find dry wood. I mean you can see here look out behind me It's gonna be hard to find really dry wood so that moisture is gonna again cool the fire down and that, that creosote is gonna build up. The key, and I'll go over it in this video, is you've gotta to learn to burn your fire pretty hot if you know that your wood is kinda of subpar or a mixture of your wood, some of it's a little wet, some of it's not. You've just gotta learn how to burn your fire hot, right? And if it's, if it's these low BTU woods, like spruce in particular, that's really sappy, um, and it's just gonna, it burns quick, you can't burn that wood cool or you're gonna end up with a lot of creosote. And this isn't all about just keeping everything clean. That's kind of secondary for you guys that are out hunting. Creosote is an indicator that you're not getting a lot of heat off your fire and you're not efficiently using the wood, okay? So it's an indicator of what you're trying to accomplish by going through the whole hassle of collecting firewood for your wood stove. So it all aligns. Too much creosote, you're not burning a good enough fire. Um, and if you're burning a hot fire, the downside is it's hard to keep one going through the night. So I'm gonna go over some tricks on how to, to deal with both of those elements and accomplish what you want to and be happy with your, your firewood in your elk, elk or deer camp up in the wilderness. I'll also show you how to fall trees, uh, dead standing trees with primitive equipment, which unfortunately that's what you have to do in the wilderness, right? First, you can't fall green trees. Obviously they're gonna be too wet. It's also illegal according to wilderness rules, so you're not gonna do that. So you end up having to fall dead trees and 
you have to farm with prim primitive equipment. It's actually a fairly advanced skill. Uh, just just the, the art of falling dead trees is considered highly dangerous by, uh, by guys that, uh, that work in the woods for a living. Um, so you have that, plus you can't use a chainsaw and you have to use primitive equipment that's slower and exposes you to the dangers of falling a dead tree for a longer period of time. So I'll give you some tips and tricks how to go through that. All right, so I hope you guys find this, this uh, video helpful and it helps you in your next elk camp. We'll get after it. All right, guys, so the first obvious question is what kind of trees am I looking for, all right, for firewood in an elk or deer wilderness camp? And uh, the first thing I'll say, and it's just the, the God's honest truth, is you're gonna end up burning what you can find, all right? So that's gonna be, you know, whatever. If you're on a creek bed, it might be cottonwood, it might be spruce, it might be aspen, because that's what you have there, and that's what you can find that's uh, dead and already seasoned by nature for you. But I'll go through uh, the different species that you're gonna see, at least in my camps, in our very prevalent and high elevation uh, wilderness areas, and I'll kinda, I'll kinda tell you the pros and cons, okay? So this is spruce. And spruce is pretty obvious to tell because when you grab it, it's not real friendly. It's kind of pokey when you grab the, the needles, okay? And then the other telltale sign of spruce is when you pull a needle off and you try to roll it in your fingers, it'll roll pretty easily. And the reason is, is the needles are actually kind of four-sided. A lot of people will call them round. They're not actually round. They're, they're either kind of a diamond or a square. Like that's the, the, the profile of them. And so they roll in your fingers. When I show you fur, you'll see that that's a very uh, distinguishing feature. But it's very obvious spruce because they're just painful to grab a hold of the needles. All right. And they're super common in Colorado. Um, for us, I would say they're the dominant tree. Um, and, and therefore, they're the dominant um, firewood. And they tend to have a fair amount of dead ones kind of dispersed within the dark timber, which is nice when you're looking for firewood because you can follow them and you can have a lot of firewood. The downside of spruce is that it doesn't have a whole lot of heat um, in terms of the quality of the firewood. You know, the, the, it depends on what source you're looking at, but the BTU on a cord of spruce is like 15 or something like that, 15, 16. And that's going to be real similar to lodgepole and other softwoods that are kind of known as, as ones that burn fast, okay? So you have to burn it fast. It doesn't provide a ton of heat, but the nice things are it's available and it, and it dries pretty quick. Uh, and it burns pretty quick. It's great kindling, right? Um, the downside is it's real sappy. So as I mentioned when I was talking about stove pipes and stuff, is if you try to dampen this wood down, um, you know, to a real slow burn, it's still going to kind of burn, burn up and not leave you coals, and it's going to leave a lot of creosote um, in your in your uh, um, your gear. Okay, so that's the downside of it. Ideally, in an elk camp, if all you have is spruce or the dominant tree you have access is spruce, try to, try to use it. Try, first, plan that you're going to have to burn a lot of firewood because you're going to be burning this stuff, stuff up with basically an open dampener most of the time. Um, but at nighttime, have a, have a separate species. Like You can usually find some aspen. Maybe if you're lucky, some pinion. If you're super, super lucky, you might find a you know a dead gambles oak or something that's pretty big diameter. And those woods all coal better than uh, spruce, and they dampen down a whole lot better than spruce. So what you can do as a strategy is have your main wood be spruce because it's available, and then you can either use aspen um, or uh, like I said, gambles oak or pinion. But really, I, I didn't mention it. Fir is probably going to be the other one you have access to. Have your fir or aspen, kind of your coal wood, set to the side of the wood stove and only use it right before you go to bed, okay? Even, even fir, like the BTU on a fir is like 20, 22 uh, per cord. So it's 30%, uh, has 30% kind of denser, kind of, uh, you know, more energy to it than spruce. And that pretty much correlates to coaling ability, right? So if you're burning, burning spruce all day and then right before you go to bed, you put in a couple nice big chunks of fir or a couple nice big chunks of aspen, you're probably going to have a coal in the morning that you can stir right up. If you just try to load it up with, with uh, spruce and dampen it down, you're probably not going to have anything other than a, bit, you know, a really creosoted in pipe in the morning, all right? So that's the strategy. Ha try to have one of those other woods 
Um, I kind of convoluted it there, but really, usually it's probably going to be fir. You're going to find spruce is usually mixing with fir. So get, get some of that fir for kind of your coal wood at night. If you got some aspen around and don't have fir, you can use aspen too. Aspen's kind of between the two. It, it coals a little bit better, and I think the BTU on aspen's around 18, 19. Um, so it's, uh, it's pretty good for, for alpine stuff too. Um, and aspen's technically a hardwood um, because it's uh, deciduous, but it's, it's low BTU like all the stuff we're dealing with. So a uh, little bit better than spruce, um, not quite as good as fir, uh, but uh, those are the woods you want to use at nighttime to kind of try to keep a coal in your wood stove. But anyway, so that's spruce. All right, guys, so this is one that you'll see around a little bit, particularly in the lower late season camps or if you're hunting other areas uh, that are just a little bit lower elevation, and that's juniper. A lot of people call it cedar. Um, and I would say in terms of camp firewood, it's probably about like spruce, maybe a little bit better. It actually smells pretty good, which is kind of nice. The thing about juniper, at least for us in our area of the Rocky Mountains, it, when you find it, it's not going to be super available. There's not big stands of it typically. Usually it's kind of dispersed, so you're going to be like basically walking around trying to find dead junipers. Uh, so if, you, if you've got it and you've got spruce around, you might as well just go with spruce. There's not a whole lot of difference. Um, the juniper, you can tell, uh, there's just two very telltale signs about it. Its needle is, is kind of almost less of a needle, but it lays flat. Looks like this. Okay, all right, and then the other thing about it is it's got this stringy bark, okay? And it's the only tree that I'm exposed to up here in the Rocky Mountains that kind of has that stringy bark. Uh, when it gets mature and older, um, a lot of times that bark, it kind of looks like Russian olive bark almost, and that's it's just got that stringiness to it when you pull it off. Um, you know, this stuff's easy to start a fire with. That's one thing nice, and I think that's mainly just because it's already kind of kind of stringy for you and and that so you can use it for that but other than that um it's not the best firewood and honestly the availability um is probably the biggest limiting factor all right guys so this here is going to be kind of what i would call like your premium wood um if there is such a thing uh for elk country unlike spruce the needles are soft okay you can grab a hold of them doesn't hurt you doesn't poke you and the profile of the needle when you pull it off is it's flat, okay? So when you try to spin it in your fingers, it's actually very difficult to spin it. It's just got two sides for the most part. Um, and that's a telltale sign between it and spruce. As I mentioned before, um, fir burns about 30% higher BTU and it coals a lot better than spruce. So a lot of times if you're in a spruce stand and there's just a few few uh, firs and you're able to find one dead fir or one kind of down fir that's got some, some naturally seasoned wood in it, take that wood from the fir and use that for your coal wood and burn your spruce uh, at the other times when you don't need something to hold hold fire for you. But if you can only... Uh, find uh, fur uh, or you, you're able to find uh, enough fur to get you through, just go with fur and don't even bother with spruce. It's going to be a lot better wood for you. But that's a telltale sign is those needles. And then just so you know, you guys know, spruce <coughs> and fur, the needles connect directly to the stem. I'll show you some lodgepole uh, in, in lodgepole and ponderosa pines. Uh, they're not a spruce or a fir, um, but one of the, the obvious uh, differences is the needles actually uh, connect in little bunches and I'll, I'll show you that uh, in a minute here. Alright guys so this one probably doesn't need any explanation but it is a viable source of firewood and that's aspen. You can see it's got this white smooth bark. It's a deciduous tree um, but it's uh, <clears throat> it's not super high BTU like other hardwoods. It's actually more more comparable to the high elevation conifers like the fir and the spruce. It's kind of in between the two. I personally put aspen a little bit behind fir, but the nice thing about aspen, if you've got it around and you've got some of it dead around, it's usually, there's usually a lot of it dead. It kind of dies and stands. So in a lot of areas, in a lot of spots where you're going to have your elk camp, aspen's going to be your go-to firewood. There's some really nice things about it. One thing is if you catch it right where it hasn't been dead for too long, um, it'll be really dry, a lot, a lot of natural seasoned wood that's standing and dead. It's easy to fall. It's actually real light and easy to handle. 
The bark's not a mess, so there's a lot of nice things about it, and it holds the coal a lot better than spruce does. All right, <clears throat> the downside of aspen, particularly when it's laying down, if you're scavenging wood, um, it goes punky and kind of rots real fast, okay? And in those cases, it's no good for, uh, for burning wood stoves. And so that's kind of the downside. Also, even when the big stands of it are dead, if they've been dead for a long time, like, you know, five, six, seven, ten years, a lot of that wood's not going to be useful. It's going to be rotten, uh, and they're going to be super dangerous to fall. They'll end up, they'll actually end up already kind of be falling apart. So just be cognizant of that. But other than that, super available uh, in the elk woods, and, and it's a good, uh, good source of firewood for you. Kind of a happy medium. All right, guys, so this is Gamble's Oak, and this is far superior firewood uh, than anything, anything else I'll show you on this video. Um, but the big negative right off the bat is availability. One, most of our elk camps in most areas you're going to be hunting elk in Colorado or other western states is going to be higher uh, than this Gamble's Oak. If you're wilderness hunting in, uh, you know, for deer or something like that, you might be surrounded uh, by Gamble's Oak. But again, it doesn't really die um, you know, sparsely. Like in a stand, you're not going to find... Uh, chunks of it that are dead and that are kind of naturally seasoned and this oak has to be seasoned for a long time or it's going to have too much moisture okay so um, that's the downside basically it's just going to be hard to find but uh, having said that by all means if you're driving into elk camp or something and you look out into a stand of gambles oak and there's a big a big old dead gambles oak tree which again happens to be pretty rare because usually what's dead and stands a gamble oak are smaller trees that have been outcompeted. So a lot of times it's the smaller trees that are dead and they just don't have the mass. They're more of like a bush, so they're hard to make firewood out of. But anyways, back to my point is if you find a big dead gamble's oak, even if you're you know it's 50 miles from from elk camp, but you see it there on the side of the road, by all means get out and cut it up because this stuff makes really good uh, coal wood, right? If you just have, you know, seven or eight chunks of it, uh, it can get you through a five, six day camp because you can stick one of those chunks in there uh, right before you go to bed and you'll have an awesome oak coal in the morning to, to get your stove off of. Uh, these are a little bit small for firewood, but they would work if they were dead. You want a little bit bigger if you can, you know, somewhere about 10 inch diameter. If you can find those that have been dead for a while, they're awesome. And, and, and just so you guys know by awesome, like when, if you look at the data on this, like Gamble's Oak, is going to be close to double uh, the energy uh, that you get out of the equivalent spruce. All right, um, so uh, it's kind of an exponential rating in the terms of in terms of how good it is. Right, like uh, this Gamble Oak is going to be like 30 BTU worth, uh, versus spruce of like 15, but that 30 BTU. BTU in terms of utility of the firewood is way better than 15 because you can dampen the wood down, you can get a good coal, you can run it all night. So this is awesome firewood, but it's going to be hard for you to find up in, up near Elk Camp. All right? All right, guys, so this is cottonwood here. In this tree, you're going to find a lot in riverbeds. Uh, you can see it's surrounded here by juniper, this stuff here, okay, cedars. Um, but cottonwood is, is around, um, particularly if you're down in river bottoms, a little bit lower elevation. Um, the reality is, is usually it's too wet uh, and it rots pretty quick. So sometimes you can find dead stuff like this that's been, that's been standing and it makes decent firewood. Stick to the high chunks of it because um, it saps up, a lot, soaks up a lot of water, uh, even from the snow that I've found. So it's marginal firewood. It's you know it's kind of it's kind of in that spruce spruce to aspen range you know in the in the mid to high teens in terms of BTU um, a lot of guys say it smells like shit whenever you burn it I don't notice that I think a lot of that um, that smells when you're burning it wet so if it's well seasoned and it's what's available it's okay um, and it'll work for you it doesn't hold the coal real well. I'd put it right in there with spruce, if not a little bit worse even, uh, just because of the availability and dealing with seeing what's, what's uh, dry enough is a, is, a, is a pretty big difficulty. All right, so that's cottonwood. All right, guys, so this is pinion pine. And the thing about pinion is it's actually very good wood. It's generally, for my camps and where I hunt, it's going to be a little bit lower than them. But again, like wilderness deer hunts, this might be fairly available. And then in a lot of other states where a lot of your elk hunting is lower elevation, pinion's a good, uh, good opportunity for good firewood. It's a lot better than the other softwoods in terms of BTU. 
like pinion puts out somewhere around that like 26 27 btu per cord and that's pretty darn close to a lot of hardwoods a lot of people will call it the uh, hardwood of the softwoods um, the downside is that a lot of times it's really dispersed it can be like juniper in that regard that on the hillside it'll be very dispersed so you might find one dead one and then within that half square mile you might only find you know 50 other live pinions so it's not the type of firewood that you're just going to go through a stand and every third tree is a dead tree uh, and it's naturally seasoned and ready to go you're probably not going to find that with pinion but if you do see it i wouldn't uh, pass it up it's great firewood um, it's got little nuts on it that are actually edible um, they don't taste good to me but they are edible um, one of the downsides is a lot of times it's small and shrubby like this some areas it grows pretty good um, it, or it gro grows pretty uh, high diameter where it can be cut up in pretty darn good firewood um, it smells spectacular as firewood it's actually very um, common in like southern Colorado and northern New Mexico uh, people use it uh, mainly just for its fragrance like outdoor fireplaces and that sort of thing but pinions a great wood I figured I'd just show it to you guys um, not real common in my area but it's a it's an opportunity for you and then I'll show you here just like the other pines and unlike spruces and firs the needles the needles on pinions on pinion because they're pine they come off in bunches so you can see there they come off in bunches okay they're a lot stubbier than your lodgepole or ponderosa but the tree is very identifiable uh, relative to uh, um, ponderosa and lodgepole the main thing is usually you're gonna find pinion dispersed within juniper sagebrush gambles oak that sort of thing it doesn't grow in big stands like you'll see lodgepole and ponderosa and just uh, one last thought on pinion it's a pretty darn good coal wood so even if you can collect a little bit and you can burn it um, at night so you've got a coal in the morning to start your wood stove back up all right guys so another uh, pine that I'll show you is uh, lodgepole pine and again, this is even more distinguished uh, than pinion. If you look at it here, you can see the needles are in bunches, okay? Like there's two, two needles uh, per bunch there on the stem like that. One of the distinguishing differences between lodgepole and ponderosa is that uh, in lodgepole, there's two needles per bunch always. Uh, in Ponderosa, you'll see two and groups of three. So if you look at this whole chunk of branch here, all of these are groups are two of two. That's how I know that this is lodgepole. In terms of the firewood, um, the firewood um, utility of this, it's basically just a step above spruce in my mind. It's uh, pretty readily available uh, in areas that have ponderosa and lodgepole. My area doesn't have a lot of pine, period. Um, but in areas that do have a lot of lodgepole and ponderosa, um, there's going to be a lot of it. And usually that means that there's going to be interdispersed standing dead uh, ponderosa or lodgepole that you can fall and can make very good firewood for you right off the bat right off the bat it's just already naturally uh, dry enough to make uh, good firewood again burns fast hot real similar to spruce in that regard um, but it's uh, it's not a bad option for you if that's what you got but that's how you identify it it's got those long needles on it um, that are in bunches and two for lodgepole two and three groups for ponderosa all right guys so the first way you're realistically going to find kind of seasoned wood um, out there in these uh, in these uh, drop camps and stuff is these type of situations all right and that's stuff that's fallen down in the past and part of it's standing up like this all right generally what you're gonna find in these situations because we have a snowpack that lasts for four or five six months here sometimes part of the tree is going to not is gonna have too high of a moisture content and then part of the tree is gonna be perfect firewood the key when you're when you're harvesting trees like this for firewood is don't make a habit 
out of pushing it into the moist stuff, right? If you take a really wet wood and you mix it with this pretty well seasoned stuff, it's kind of a mute point. You've basically just done a bunch of work for, for no reason. So just be conservative about where, um, where you take firewood from these sort of down downfall situations if the trees are down a lot of times you'll see this in spruce and fir they're down and they're only like a foot off the ground they're probably never going to have the right moisture content all right you need them to be up okay and realistically the best stuff is kind of like chest high um che you know chest and higher is going to be the best because for the most part that's going to be out of the snowpack during the winter, at least in, in most areas, or at least it's going to thaw out and, and get time to dry before hunting season pretty good, all right? So like on this tree, this happens to be actually a cottonwood. You're probably not going to see cottonwoods in, in elk camp. I'm, I'm in lower elevation right now, um, but it gives you an example of this situation. On this tree, what I would take is probably from about here up. Okay, and that's going to end up being being good firewood. All right, a lot of times stuff like this, this right here, you can just pull it off, and it's usually pretty good. Also, if it's if it's lost all of its bark on spruce, fir, or cottonwoods, or or whatever, it's usually dry enough uh, to make pretty good firewood. All right, so you can scavenge a lot of that stuff. All right, guys. So the next way you're going to acquire kind of nature's pre-seasoned firewood up in the elk woods is these conifers that have been standing dead for a while. Conifers tend to stay standing long enough without rotting that the wood's gonna have low enough moisture content that it'll burn pretty well uh, in a wood stove uh, or, or just an out, out, outdoor fire too. Some telltale signs that it's dry enough. One, all your needles are gonna be gone off these conifers uh, when they're dry enough. And then these branches are gonna be where you can break them off okay and that's actually a decent source of firewood too if you don't want to fell these trees like if they're much bigger than this and you just don't feel safe falling them uh, on your own you can just pull these branches off a lot of times the bigger conifers you know the ones that are 15 16 uh, inches in diameter they'll have you know branches that are this this big and they actually are pretty decent uh, firewood so that's an option for you too um, but the other telltale sign that the tree is going to be dry enough is it's going to be missing some bark, all right? If it's missing all the bark, sometimes those trees are rotten uh, and they're kind of hard to fall and they're, they're going to actually have picked up a little moisture, particularly in the lower third of the tree or whatever. So this is kind of the happy medium where some of the bark's coming off, all your branches are dry, all right? And uh, I would say kind of focus on trees this big and smaller, all right? Like this tree here, you can already see it's starting to crack down the middle here, okay? And just to kind of comment on what I said in the introduction, fallen trees like this that are dead, even with modern equipment, i.e. chainsaws, is actually kind of considered a, a fairly uh, dangerous uh, thing to do. So a couple of things to really watch for, particularly if the tree's drier than this and missing all of its bark or whatever, is these branches up here uh, can fall down and hurt you. They could even kill you if they're big enough. So a lot of times what I'll do with an ax is I'll just kind of tap it and see, you know, see what, while I'm watching. Because unfortunately with these axes, I'm gonna be under this tree working on it for a long time to fall it, and I'm gonna be hitting it a bunch of times. So if a branch is gonna fall, I'd much prefer it right now while I'm looking. So that's, that's the first thing you wanna, you wanna think about. Um, so the second thing is, is you just wanna be able to get away from it. The reality is, is that when you're falling a tree with an ax, you're not gonna have as much directional control as you would with a chainsaw, okay? That's just a fact. Um, and it has to do with the fact that particularly if you haven't used an ax a whole lot, just getting your, your cuts in the right spot where the direction's perfect is going to be a lot more difficult for you. Um, and then uh, the other reality is these trees are dead, right? So they can split, they can barber chair, the hinge can break on you, all, sort of, all sorts of those things. So don't try to follow these against their natural lean or branches or whatever, all right? You need to follow them the way they're naturally going to fall. Don't, don't push that, okay? Because the way you cut them with an ax, they can easily backfall, you know, uh, on you or, or whatever. So just make sure you can get away from the tree and don't depend, you know, sp specifically on directional falling and being able to drop it between two other trees. 
If that's the case and you have to do that or it's near 10 or something, uh, don't do it. Just find another tree somewhere else, all right? All right, so I'm gonna go through how to fall this tree with an ax. The first thing I'm gonna do is just clean up everything that can be a pain in my ass here. Um, one of the things that's a little tricky on this tree is it's actually got a big cottonwood behind it here that I'm gonna have to deal with uh, when I do my back cut on the tree. Um, but I'll deal with that as it is. None of these situations is perfect. When you're cleaning this stuff up, guys, you know, really be cognizant and careful with your ax, all right? Um, one of the, the key things, like if you're cutting stuff overhead like that or whatever, you know, it's kind of a no-no. But if you got total control of the ax, two hands, just use it to knock this stuff off and you'll be okay. I'd rather have that than have it dangling around my head when I'm trying to work, all right? So, <clears throat> however, when you're taking full swings at one of these trees, think about the arch of your ax, okay? So for me, the arch of my ax is gonna go like this, okay? So if I try to follow the tree where I am right now, it's fairly dangerous, okay? If I'm taking hacks at it right here, because the arc of this ax can come right back into my foot or my knees or whatever, okay? So that's super dangerous. What you wanna do is you wanna follow these things and you want your cuts to be low enough that the ground and the tree are helping you out, all right? Get all the shit out of the way, okay? In the sense is that, like, I'm just gonna show you, this, is, this will actually be kind of where my back cut is, but the sense of it is, is when I drop the ax, okay? And it's gonna fall like that. If I miss the tree, you know, or it bounces off the tree or whatever, it's gonna end up in the dirt or the tree, all right? You don't want to have, a lot of guys will want to take these trees out up high because it's physically easier to swing their axe from here, okay? The problem with that is your arch makes you exposed to your axe. So be really cognizant of that and cut these as low as possible, okay? Where, you know, you have some safety measures in place, all right? The other thing is, is make sure your axe is sharp. Um, the duller your axe is, the, the much less safe it is. All right, because it can do it can do this, which is it can kind of bounce off of there. If it's not real sharp, you're going to get more of this kind of stuff. That's dangerous. All right, and then the other thing is when you're first kind of learning, I would work on your angle more into the tree, like a wider angle, um, than uh, than doing a shallow angle. Okay, and the reason is is that it's either you'll find a happy medium if you do two too much of an angle into the tree. I guess that's actually not wider. It's a, be like a more acute angle. Um, if you're doing like that, um, your ax is not gonna be as effective. It's gonna be a lot safer. If you're doing like this, see, you know, if you do like that where the, the angle is more, I guess it'd be more obtuse or bigger, I guess. If you're doing that, it's actually fairly effective when you catch the wood of the tree but it's pretty darn dangerous because you can have a lot of this bouncing off stuff, all right? So when you're starting, uh, go with the, the idea of a little bit smaller angle into the tree so you're hitting the tree pretty good, all right? I'll just mention a couple more things real quick uh, before I drop this tree. This tree, um, because it's size, it's probably, it's probably dry all the way pretty darn close to the stump, but you might find with a lot of these trees that the top is really good firewood and you get down in here to the bottom fifth of the tree or whatever and it's not so good so you need to be uh, cognizant of that and just like on the other the other uh, wood uh, uh, finding method that I showed you where you're just looking for stuff that's just up out of the snowpack a little bit um, the same deal applies if it's if it's going to be even marginally too moist for your fire just leave it there and find other wood okay um, but you're on these dead trees Usually towards the end there, you're going to have some really, really good wood, okay? All right, so what I'm going to do, if I had a, uh, uh, you know, wood saw with me, what I would do is I would cut my, my face cut base in here, okay? Like a straight line in here, saw across here and have a flat, flat, flat line, and then I'd ax into that, okay, to create my, my, uh, my face cut. Um, in this case, I'm just going to use an ax, and a lot of times that's all, all you're going to have. So I think that's more realistic. There's kind of two ways you can do this. You can have that same concept and just do a, what's more what they call a conventional face cut. And that's just going to be here into the, into the tree like this, down. And that's a lot easier with an ax because it's easier to go down into the tree like this rather than up into the tree 
like this, okay? It's also a lot, a lot safer to go like this, all right? The only reason you would want to cut like an open face here and here is if you wanted the stump of the tree to hit the ground first. A lot of times that's a little bit um, handy if you're falling a tree because you're going to use it for like a tent pole or something. Um, a lot of times if you're dropping a tree for say like a ridge pole for a big tent and the tree happens to be 40 foot and the, per the top of it is just perfect uh, for a ridge pole, a lot of times um, what you'll do is if you do a conventional cut, actually the top of the tree is going to hit the ground first before the butt of the tree. And when that happens, a lot of times that last 20 feet of the tree will break off, okay? Particularly a dry, uh, a dead dry tree, so um, that's been dry for a long time. It'll break that off, and now all of a sudden you don't have access to your ridge pole anymore, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and cut this face in here, and you'll see what I'm going for. And what I like to do is I like to go boom this side, this side, and then center, okay? If I'm really thinking about direction, basically if I put my axe in there, you know, perpendicular to the cut, the face cut, should fall kind of aligned with that. All right, so. You can see here, I'm about a third of the way through the tree here. That's what I like to do. I don't like to go further. A lot of times what you see guys do is they'll take this face cut way in. And when you do that on a dead tree, you're risking that that tree's gonna barber chair or just kind of blow up on you. And you're gonna lose total directional control of it, which is very dangerous, okay? So I don't like to go any deeper than like a third to a half. I could go a little bit deeper here and this face cut is probably a little bit open so I'll kind of go in a little bit further and shallow up that angle a little bit and then I'll come axe into this back cut a little bit. So right here on this tree I'm going to create a hinge right here. I don't want to cut through that hinge. I don't want to cut through that hinge, okay? I'm going to create a little hinge right here. And that's what's going to keep this tree under control when it falls, okay? So I want to be really careful. I'm going to create a hinge about that big. And then I'm going to go a couple of inches above the apex of my face cut, okay? So you'll see that. First, I'm going to just skip around here and just clean this up so I don't have any what's called a Dutchman in here that's going to jack the tree up and, and barber chair it. I'm just going to clean this out a little bit. You can look up Dutchman's kind of understand that concept but I'm going to leave about that much probably about a sixth to seventh of the tree like that if not a little more come in here in the back do another cut or another uh, cut with my axe that's just a couple inches higher so it goes so it kind of keeps that tree from from back leaning on me one thing that's nice if you got a wood saw you can do this you have a lot more control over your back cut and you can saw in here with your wood saw just ch -ch 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 -ch. and it's a bit safer and you're gonna have more control because you can be specific where that is and you can be very careful not to not to cut your hands and lose control of the tree but an axe you just kind of got to deal with it so go a little higher and come in here the other thing really nice about a wood saw when you do this is that if the tree does want to backfall on you it wants to go against where you're trying to fall it you're gonna feel it because it's gonna lay back on that saw and you're gonna know, okay, I gotta deal with this because this tree's trying to back, uh, back uh, lean over my saw, okay? In this case, the tree's for sure gonna fall that way. Um, but that is a nice aspect of a wood saw or a cross cut. You know it, how the tree's moving because it's gonna pinch your saw. And here's gonna be a little tricky 
Could have an obstacle. One of the keys that's a little bit difficult with an axe is you want to keep your, your uh, hinge same thickness here as it is on the other side of the tree. It's a hot, lot harder to do that because it's just hard to know where you're at. In this case, I can see my hinge is a lot thicker over here. And the problem with that is when a tree falls, that thicker hinge will pull it that way. So you want to kind of keep them even, eat even if you want to keep directional control. And here's a little tricky for me, and it's not great for the ax, but because I don't have an angle at the tree here, it's hard for me to get in there, so I end up kind of wedging some of that out of there. See where I am, but try not to do that if you can. So in here, this tree's gonna go soon, I can hear it. But I wanna watch in these dead trees, not so much on a tree like this, but a tree that doesn't have other roots around it. These really dead trees, sometimes a root ball will come up with them when they start getting weighed out here. So be cognizant of that too, be able to get away. Be listening for that tree. Tree's moving around a lot. Probably just give it a quick, quick push. It's gonna fall. In this case, it's on a couple fur limbs. All right, so I think going over this hinge will kind of be helpful to you guys, and I'll critique myself. One, you can see that this wood is super dry. It's gonna make good firewood all the way to the base here. But I'll just clean this hinge up. For an ax hinge, for an ax hinge, it wasn't too bad, okay? But it's pretty damn thick. So that tree went, that tree there went on a pretty thick, thick uh, hinge, okay? Um, so uh, regardless, this end here is a little bit thinner and this end's a little bit thicker. Like I said, for an ax hinge, it's not bad, but the tree did rotate a little bit that way. It fell a little bit to that way where I wanted. I kind of wanted it a little bit further here in the open, okay? But that's just the, the nature of cutting with an ax, all right? And then here's your face cut. You can see it hinged off of there uh, nice and clean. Um, you obviously can't see it here, but you can see it here, all that back cut was clean and and so was this okay so there wasn't really any dutchman there to to force the tree into a barber chair kind of explode on you but uh, anyways that's the best way to fall a tree like this so the advantage of this obviously instead of out there just scavenging up tree the trees that have already fallen as you can see how much wood is here all these branches all these branches will be usable in a wall tent type of wood stove you can use the branches for kindling, and then you can buck up uh, the, main, the main tree, um, and you'll have great logs uh, for that wood stove. They'll fit in there perfectly. So one of the tricks, I'll just go over limbing real quick with an ax. Um, generally, you kind of want to go with the grain of the limbs, all right? So these limbs are actually all flowing this way, kind of you know down uh, with gravity. So when you limb them, you're actually going to want to limb them like this, okay? A lot of people, they kind of want to go, they kind of want to go the inverse way, like this, and it ends up just being harder for you. 
The other safety thing is, is when you're limbing, try to always limb the other side uh, from where you're at. So again, like your axe glancing off like that, you know, it's gonna go on that side. Or you go in, it doesn't go through the tree and hit you in the knee or whatever, all right? So you basically, you wanna limb the side that you're, that you're not on, if possible, okay? And again, these will make good uh, firewood. Now, a little trick for you, in these conifers, a lot of times just right here, in the, in the base of these branches, right in here, right in here, just for maybe the first inch or so. On, on hardwoods, it'll be longer, um, but a lot of times just right here, in the base, right at that junction of the trunk and the branch, you can find what a lot of guys call fat wood. And it's basically just wood that's that's kind of impregnated with with resin. And that stuff, this stuff is really good for fire making. It'll kind of be amber. And on this tree here, there's just a little bit on this higher branch. Probably if I went down here in the lower branch, the lower branches where, where that resin kind of flowed down as the tree died. If I just cut in there, two hands, like this. You're gonna see some wood that's just got an amber, kind of an amber tint to it. And that amber tint, or that am amber tint is the resin in it. Hopefully you can see it there. There's a, you can see there that's got the resin on it. And that stuff will burn real good and you can kind of use it as a natural starter. So I'm gonna go through and limb this tree and then bucket. Uh, I'll show you bucking real quick. There's no point in us kind of dealing with that all right now. Big trees, the old school way of bucking them with an ax is actually to stand up on top of them. A tree like this, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to be careful of my arc of my ax <clears throat> by being over here. I'm not going to be up close where that arc of the ax is. Ax could slip by and get me in the knee or whatever. I'm going to be out here where that arc of the ax is going to go into the tree or the ground, all right? So when you're bucking tree trees with an ax, you basically just got to start wide and here you could do kind of more of a traditional axe stroke where you slide up your axe handle and what I would recommend in an elk camp situation all these little pieces use them for kindling all right, guys, so I hope that was helpful to you. I hope I went over some subjects that will help you when you're out there in elk or deer camp in the wilderness, and you can actually pick the right firewood, know where to find it, and be confident in that regard. I think you'll find that it's, it seems like it's kind of like a arcane subject, but I find that if you understand it, you're going to be a lot better in camp, and your camp is going to be run a lot better, um, and you're not going to waste as much time cutting wood that's too wet or or doesn't provide what you what you need. So I hope that's uh, helpful to you guys. Um, just just as a summary, I'll throw up a little image here, kind of my suggestions, kind of for the high elevation stuff. Usually what I'm doing is my main firewood is an abundant amount of spruce. Most of them are going to fall uh, out, of, out of dead standing trees or I'm going to pick it uh, at, you know, out of just trees that are downfall but up high. Um, and then I'm going to use firs as kind of my coal wood right before uh, I go to bed in the wall tent. Um, if I've got the availability of aspen, I'll use it in the place of fir. If I'm a little bit lower elevation where there's a lot of transition between uh, spruce and fir and aspen, I'll tend to only use aspen, particularly if it's available and it's, uh, and it's dead and available. I'll use it and burn it. Um, 
and it's going to coal pretty good for me, I can be real consistent. If I get to lower elevations, I'm going to try to use, you know, my spruce and aspen and fir a little bit if it's still available. Usually it's still pretty dominant in terms of, of, of what I can get. Sometimes there's going to be ponderosa and lodgepole mixed in where pine beetles gone through and killed a lot of that stuff. That's a great kind of standard uh, wood. But then I'm going to try to pick off some either, you know, gambles oak that's been dry for a long time or some dead. Um, some dead uh, pinion pine and I'm going to use that for my coal wood. I might throw a little cedar juniper in there if it's available but honestly I don't see it as that much better uh, than spruce or spruce or lodgepole or ponderosa to justify going out there specifically uh, trying to get uh, dead cedar. So usually in those elevations I'm going to use uh, kind of my fast burning uh, low BTU wood and then mix in um, pinion as my coal wood. And then if I'm real lucky I'll throw in some gambles oak. So anyways guys I hope that was helpful to you and I hope you find it uh, as a useful skill set uh, when you're out there in your next elk or deer camp in the wilderness.